Hi, I'm Richard Moraes, Senior Minister at Unity of Phoenix Spiritual Center, and I want to thank you for visiting our website and for tuning in to today's message. If you feel inspired by today's talk, I really encourage you to make a donation by hitting that button below and making a contribution to this ministry. It'll allow us to continue these messages online and to do the great work we do here at Unity of Phoenix, which is to inspire people to live better lives. So thanks for tuning in, thanks for your support, and we hope to see you at a Sunday real soon. Good morning again, everyone. So how many people have ever run away from a problem instead of facing it? And how many people have ever had to have a, a difficult conversation or make a difficult decision and you kept putting it off and procrastinating because you really didn't, didn't want to deal with it? And how many people ever wanted to achieve a goal but the next step was going to be really challenging and difficult, it was going to be really hard and you decided not to do it instead of actually doing it. You know, every single one of us has challenges and problems and difficulties. Every one of us has hard work to do and hard decisions to make, but I'm always amazed how often we try to avoid these difficult parts of life. You know, we avoid people and talking to them. We avoid sharing our feelings honestly. We avoid sometimes getting help that we need. We avoid responsibility and taking on bigger projects. And we avoid leaving a job that we're unhappy with or leaving a relationship or situation that isn't going well. It's amazing how we avoid so many actions and decisions in our lives. You know, we avoid so many things. It kind of reminds me of this guy whose voicemail, you know, it was, hi, I'm Bill. Uh, I'm probably home right now, but there's someone I'm really wanting to avoid that I don't like. Please leave a message. And if I don't get back to you, it's probably you're the one that I'm avoiding and I don't like. <laughs> it's amazing how much we avoid. And I'm not talking about avoiding dangerous or difficult situations that aren't appropriate. Those things should be avoided. I'm talking about how often we avoid things that are good, that are important for us and beneficial to us. And so the question is, why do we avoid things that are actually good for us? And the first reason is because they're hard. We don't like things to be hard. Sometimes we give up the benefit of the good to avoid hard work. We think it should be easy. The second uh, reason we avoid is because we don't like feeling uncomfortable. We're dealing with the uncomfortable emotions of taking something on or faking, uh, facing something. Uh, we don't like our uncomfortable emotions and we get nervous about other people and how they might react. Another aspect of why we avoid is because of fear. Fear of rejection, um, fear of loss, fear of embarrassment, fear of failure. And the final reason we avoid these important uh, decisions and actions is because we don't want the responsibility of making a mistake or a bad choice. We don't want to be responsible you know, for our lives getting worse instead of actually getting better. You know, every one of us wants our lives to change, to improve, and to be transformed. And yet, we avoid the very things, the difficult steps or actions that will actually change our lives, improve our lives and transform our lives. You know, the great mystic Joseph Campbell once said, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure that you seek. So the cave, the thing that's in front of you that you're avoiding and you don't want to face is actually the thing that'll give you the benefit that you're seeking, the clarity or the healing or, or the peace I mean, how many people have ever had something that was difficult that you didn't want to do that you ended up doing and you found out it was actually kind of liberating and you felt better afterwards? Let me give you two simple examples. I'm afraid of heights. And I was scared and somebody was trying to get me to go on a roller coaster for the first time. And I was terrified. I was always avoiding it. I didn't want to go. And I remember it's going to go up and it would click, 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 and then up over that top and ah, felt like my uh, stomach was in my mouth and I'd freak out. I was freaking out. And at the end of it, I said, Let's do it again. The things we're afraid of, sometimes when we go through them, aren't as scary. I've had conversations that I worked myself up about being afraid to have, and when I have them, it was a great relief for me and for the other person, and things were better. Remember the story of David and Goliath? One of the things is Goliath was a, a Philistine giant, and the Israelite soldiers were all terrified. No one would go against him, and except David, who wasn't even a soldier. They all avoided the Goliath, but David was willing to take it on and face it, and he destroyed the, uh, the, uh, the giant, Goliath. 
So what Goliath in your life are you letting scare you and that you're avoiding? What are the feelings that you aren't willing to face or things that you aren't willing to admit or choices or decisions are you not willing uh, to, to make a decision or take action on? You know, one of the things I truly believe is all these things that we avoid, we actually cheat ourselves out of the strength and the learning and the wisdom and the awareness and insight that they end up giving us. You know, David, because of that, grew as a leader. He eventually became king. There's always benefits when we face these difficult decisions and actions that will bring us uh, greater blessings and actually expand us in greater ways. You know, today is Palm Sunday. It's the day we celebrate the triumphant entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem. It is the week that actually triggers everything of the Easter season that eventually brings about the miraculous resurrection of Jesus. All those things were meant and needed to, to, to happen. And Jesus, this is a perfect example of embracing the difficult things to do rather than avoiding them. And so uh, we're continuing in our four-week series, our uh, contracted uh, Lenten series. This is week three. Week one was about fasting. And it's not just about physical fast, it's about fasting and pulling away from the attachments to whether it's food or money or possessions or image that we give so much energy uh, to that. It's about pulling it away and actually giving more time to God. And so your challenge was to double the amount of meditation time from now until Easter, to turn away from the outer attachments of the world and concerns and give your undivided attention to God more, to spirit. Last week, we talked about feasting, feeding the mind on the good, on the abundance and the blessings, because our thoughts really create our experience. So if we feed ourselves, you know, all the good, all the blessings, the possibilities, and the truth of who we are, it will expand our lives and our consciousness. Today, we're looking at embracing. And uh, I'll give a, a quote to give an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, Rabindranath Tagore, the Chinese poet, uh, the, the Indian uh, writer and poet said, to find God, you must welcome everything. To find God, you must welcome everything, which I would say to find God and the fullness of life, you must embrace everything. Don't run or hide or pretend or deny the challenges in life. You need to welcome them. You need to embrace them. And that will help us experience the fullness of life and the fullness of God. So what do we need to do to embrace everything? The first one is we got to own what is ours. Have you ever had something come up in your life and you said to yourself, I wish this didn't happen. This isn't what I wanted to be dealing with. This isn't what I signed up for. This is the last thing I want to be dealing with right now. Ever have one of those? We all get those. We don't want to own it. We want to avoid it and pretend and deny. I mean, I'll tell you, with my shoulder, there's a part of me was like, really, God? The guy that's walking on crutches that can't use his leg, let's take away his shoulder for a while? This must have been some spiritual snafu, some cosmic error, some divine glitch or mistake. You know, you ever, you ever have one of those? We kind of wish it was something else or wish it was different. Now, we could all whine till the cows come home, but guess what? At the end of the day, that thing is still in front of us. It is still something we need to deal and something we need to face. We can think we're born in the wrong family. We can think we're born in the wrong era. We can think that this situation shouldn't have happened, but ultimately it comes back at some point. We need to face it and we need to own it. Could you imagine if Jesus said, hey God, could we just skip the uh, Jerusalem and the hatred and the betrayal and the trial and torture and just kind of get onto the resurrection. Yeah, could you imagine if Jesus wanted to avoid this? How many good things would have been missed had Jesus avoided? And Jesus didn't avoid, even though it's hard. You know why? Because he knew it was his to do. This was his difference to make. This was his contribution to the world. Listen to the words in John 12, uh, 27 to 28. It says, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, for this purpose, I have come to this hour. And Jesus is saying, this isn't easy, but I know this is what I'm supposed to do. The fact is, folks, life isn't easy. Do you ever hear that expression, we're spiritual beings having a human experience? Well, sometimes based on the fact that we want to avoid pain, 
We want to avoid struggle. We want to avoid being pushed to the limits. We want to avoid hard work. It seems like we're spiritual beings trying to avoid human experience. Jesus didn't try to avoid the human experience. Jesus got frustrated. He was troubled. He was grieved. He wanted to give up and he wept. And even though it wasn't easy, Jesus was absolutely clear this was his to do and he owned it. Somebody once said, until you face it with grace, it'll always be in your face, which is the spiritual equivalent of you can run, but you can't hide. So my question is, what is in front of you right now that you're avoiding? Well, let's flip that around. What is in front of you right now that you know it's time for you to embrace? Because the truth is, it is yours. It is part of your journey. It has come to teach you, heal you, and help you in some great way but you've got to embrace it. You've got to welcome it, as Tagore says, so you can experience the fullness of God and the fullness of life. First thing to do to embrace is you got to own what is yours. And then the second thing is you got to trust. You know, our money says, in God we trust. But I'll tell you as a kid, when I heard someone say, I surrender my will and my life to God, it kind of scared me. Because I thought my will was a pretty good will. It was a pretty excellent God to sign off on my will. It's a good will. And uh, we plan. And yet I'd get scared when I hear, my, not my will, but thy will. I'd be thinking, wow, maybe God wants me to do something way harder than I did. Remember Jesus um, in Gethsemane? He said, Father, if you can, take this cup from me. But not my will, thy will be done. Do you know why Jesus was able to say that? Because he absolutely trusted that God's will for us is good and only good. He trusted, regardless of what it looked like in the moment, that God's will is the highest and best. Here are a couple of wonderful lines about trust in the Bible. Proverbs 3, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding, but acknowledge him in all your ways and he will make straight your paths. Do you trust that God will make straight your path? Do you trust that you can lead on God? Book of Jeremiah says, for surely I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, um, not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. So do you trust that God has a plan for you? Roman 8 says, all things work together for good for those who love God. Do you trust it, whether it's up or down, that all things are working together for your highest good? Do you trust that you have what it takes to, to handle everything. You know, it says in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What I believe is the very same power that created us and the same power that brought this to us is the same power we can trust to get us through it. The one that brought us to it will get us through it. The question is, do you trust that? You know, I remember in my first physical therapy uh, session, um, I had hurt my arm trying to reach, trying to save a glass from breaking. I was in a lot of pain. And then when the therapist uh, came over, he said, you know, I noticed the way you're sitting, you're kind of favoring your arm. I could see you're trying to protect it and you're, you're not trying to move it at all so you don't get hurt. And he said, you know, that kind of makes sense to a certain extent, but here's a challenge. is when you're afraid to move your arm, it creates stress and tension and it actually resists the blood flow. And if you're afraid to move it, it actually, it, it, it can freeze your arm and make it tighter and, and, and things actually don't heal quicker. He said, what you need to do is to actually relax your muscles. Don't be afraid for a little movement because it needs some movement for the blood to flow and for the healing to happen. And for that to happen, you need to let go and trust that your body will heal you and your body wants to heal you. And I thought to myself, my God, this therapist is a spiritual teacher. Because in life, when things don't go well, we want to pull back and protect. We don't want to move. We don't want to get hurt. But what he's saying is you gotta relax. You gotta trust. You gotta open up to some movement and trust and know that spirit will heal, that spirit will bring greater things. So where are you protecting yourself and are afraid? Because the truth is what we need to do is trust that the universe is supporting us. Trust that God is providing for us and conspiring for our happiness and success if we just let go and if we just trust that. Carl Fried van Durkheim once said in his book, The Way to Transformation, he says, the way to transformation 
is to willingly open ourselves. It is not to play it safe. It is not to be closed off, but to be open fully to all the situations of life. Only the person that is willing to risk themselves and expose themselves to life, only those can discover that indestructible spirit within them. And so the question is, do you trust that God has a plan for you? And do you trust enough to know whatever you're going through will lead you to something greater and better? You know, every one of us trusts that the sun's gonna to rise tomorrow morning. But can you put that same trust in God in knowing that you're on your right path and course and God has something great if you just let go and open up to it? So the final thing I wanna talk about is about how we show up uh, in these situations. You know, it says, uh, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. You know, glory to God and Hosanna in the highest. And it, what it shows is that Jesus showed up and entered into Jerusalem, this difficult situation with his head held high on a donkey, humble and confident, and he entered in the name of the Lord. Back then in the Bible, a name was your nature. So he entered blessed, enriched uh, in the consciousness or nature of God. He came uh, through calm and poised and centered in God, even though he knew what was going on. Could you imagine if Jesus came through insecure and scared and terrified? He chose to show up in a spiritually conscious way, in a way that is open and loving and positive. You know, is there a situation in your life that isn't going well? I want you to think about it. how are you showing up in that situation? Are you showing up in, in faith? Are you showing up grounded and poised? I, thought I sometimes have situations where I don't show up so good. And then afterwards, I think, how could I show up better in that? And I think sometimes, you know what? I think I could have listened better. Or I could have been more compassionate. Or I could have been more clear. Or I could have been more supportive or loving. So think about the situation that's going on in your life. What's a better way that you could show? Because all these qualities are in us. The kingdom of God is within. And we get to choose how we show up in life. So the question is, how are you showing up and what's a better way you can show up to be more present, to be more engaged, to be more loving, to be more clear, to be more open? Because when we hold those intentions, like Jesus walked in, you know, with his head held high in a consciousness and a mindset of God, you knew the way he experienced it and what the result was going to be was going to be for the best. Let me give you a couple of examples, and I've given them before, but they're so good, yeah, about how to show up in life. The first one is Nelson Mandela. Could you imagine 26 years in prison? So he's in prison for 26 years, comes out, and a few years later, he becomes the president of his, com uh, of his country um, and in his 70s, and is considered a, a statesman still to this day. He's passed away, of course, revered. And how did he do that? Was it just how he showed up when he got out of jail? I would say no. It's how he showed up every day of those 26 years in a consciousness, not of this is unfair and this is wrong, but a consciousness of, I want to make a difference. You know, I want to end apartheid. I want people to be free. I want harmony. And he wanted to be a channel for that. So he showed up in an amazing way, even in prison, that had him make a huge impact uh, of being president of his country and a statesman and considered one of the great leaders of our time. Another great example of how we show up was a friend of mine named Ron Black. He used to attend Unity. And he, he had cancer. And he was my guitar teacher. And he'd come once a week and we had such a good time. He loved music so much. He'd play. I said, the guy's on fire. He was like so excited. Most of the lesson was really him playing and me watching. And uh, I didn't mind. He was the greatest uh, guitar teacher, but boy, did I love watching someone who had passion for music. It was incredible. So he had cancer. And about two or three months later, he had collapsed and that got a call from his partner. He was in the hospital and the cancer was in his liver, it was in his lungs and just spread to his brain. And so he was gonna um, have to be in hospice and it wasn't gonna be much longer. So I went to the hospital and already knowing this, I come in and his uh, girlfriend's there and he's on the bed and he kind of motions me over and I come over, I put my hand on him and lean uh, near him and he says, Rich, I got some bad news. And I leaned in and I said, what is it? And I already thought I knew what it was and he said, I'm going to have to cancel your guitar lesson this week. And we started howling. 
And here this guy, while he's dying, is showing up with joy, showing up with humor. He had a motto and he said, the best way to die well is to live well. And I can tell you, Ron Black lived well. Strangely, about two or three weeks later, in the hospice facility, we actually had a living memorial for him, where every one of us, to his face, got to share how much we love him, how much we appreciated him. Of course, it was a musical jam session, and people even Skyped in. It was one of the most amazing things. I mean, whether it's in prison or in dying or whatever situation you're facing now, we have the choice to choose how we show up. And how we show up absolutely makes a difference. 23rd Psalm says, Yea, though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And the fact is, every one of us has to walk through a valley. It doesn't say walk around a valley. We have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. To walk through the valley of the shadow of whatever difficulty we're facing, we have to walk through it. We get to choose how. You know, and the fact is, whatever it is that's in front of you, it is your valley. It is your path. It is your cave. You know, it is your Goliath. It is your Jerusalem. And you get to choose how you enter it and how you handle it. You know, Mark Twain once said, the things we regret most in life not are, the, are not the things we do. It's the things we wish we did, the things we wish we said. So let's not live with regret. Whatever is before you that you're avoiding, I invite you to face it by owning it, by trusting it, and showing up in the greatest way ever. Whatever is in front of you is there to teach you, to support you, to expand you and grow you. The question is, is it something you're going to avoid or embrace? And I say, let's embrace it. God bless you all, and I'll see you next Sunday.